This time on the Magic Kitchen podcast, we're discussing animal harm within the craft. I'm Leander Witchwood. And I'm Elise Wells. And welcome to the Magic Kitchen podcast, where we talk about magic, kitchen witchcraft, herbs, and everything in between. So recently on social media, I have been seeing a lot of discussion and banter and arguing even over the idea of an- using animals in the craft for one and the the concept or the act of harming animals to be used in your craft. And I know I have a lot of strong, strong opinions on this, at least I'm sure you do too. <laughs> And we're going to discuss them this time on the Magic Kitchen podcast to give you a a perspective of why we feel the way we feel and maybe even a perspective of why other practitioners would not feel the same and then allow you to come up with the solution or the practice that best suits your practice. And I know this is going to get for some, it's going to become a trigger. It's going to become something that, you know, may enrage some listeners. I know the (laughs) comments I've been reading and the backtracking I've been seeing from a lot of creators is very interesting to watch. And yeah, it does. It makes me angry too to see some of this where they, you know, proclaim something and then they get a lot of backlash and all of a sudden they change their mind on it or they, you know, quote unquote, clarify their position. (laughs) So I'm hoping that we can be very clear (laughs) about our position in this matter. And, you know, if you want to learn from us, you're going to learn from us and you're going to learn from our perspective. And that's acceptable. That's okay. You don't have to listen to someone else who is telling you that you should be doing something when you feel in your heart that it's wrong. Yeah. Yeah. And and maybe that's where we should start is I personally feel that there is never Capital N, capital E, capital V, capital E, capital R, a time that hurting <laughs> an animal is yes. okay. It, it doesn't matter. There's just no reason to do it in your magical practice. If your yeah. goal is to, you know, find love by sacrificing an animal, how in the world is that going to work? How is that energetically going to be the right thing? If, like some spells say, some ancient spells, you know, you want to contact Takate. We know dogs are sacred to mm-hmm. her. So we'll just sacrifice right. a dog to her. Why mm-hmm. would she want that? It just does not right. add up. It just does not make sense. And I'm not going to test it out <laughs> to see if it works, but I just right. can't imagine it does. And what would be so worth doing that you would want to have that kind of suffering and, and like visceral experience on your hands? Like, what would be worth that? I just can't think of anything. I can't. Yeah. Again, like I, I have strong opinions on this too. And I, for me, in my craft, because I can only speak from my perspective, the, and the way I was trained and the ideals and morals and ethics that I hold within my craft. Yeah. Never capital everything, all caps. There's never a reason to harm an animal. Now, the reason for this in my craft is because if I feel squeamish about something, if I feel that it is wrong, if I feel that it is changing my vibration in a spell, because where do we do spells? Where do we do our work? We do it in the liminal. This is where the power is. And we connect with those energies within that liminal space and bring it into the physical world to make change. So if I am reaching into that liminal space and I am conducting myself in a way 
that is not in alignment with my own values, my own morals, my own ethics, and the morals and ethics of the world I live in, then I am not working in alignment with that spell. So it's not going to work for me. Now, that's not to say that some other practitioner out there has no issue and no qualms, no moral uh, regard to harming animals. And that's their craft. That's the energy they have to deal with themselves. But in my craft, you will not see me harming an animal. You will not see me wrongfully or making a justification to kill an animal for a body part or to take a body part that is not mine to take, that is not gifted to me in some um, ethical fashion. If you're a newer witch and you're looking at these debates on social media or you're seeing practitioners writing in books, books written by, books put out by publishers about animal right. sacrifice or animal, and that's two different things. We're going to talk about that too about using yes. animals in the craft, it can be very confusing. So what we want to do in this episode is not weigh in and take down other witches and tell you know tell you what not to read or what not to do. Instead, we're just going to right. go into a little bit of the history, a little bit of the precedence for where animal usage in spells, ritual, and magic can come from. So that you can have just some information on this subject, because it is something that is being talked about now, whether it should be or not. You know, maybe I, I, I like to think that when things come up, it's because there's something in the collective consciousness that needs to be healed and needs to be discussed. Yes. So yes. I think that's this is a good time to to discuss it. So hopefully you are your questions get answered here. And if they don't, you can always reach out to us. We're happy to talk more about it. Send us your questions and we can always yeah. add on some questions at the end of an episode in the future too for other listeners if it's a big helpful topic. Yeah. And and don't forget that we also, after each episode airs initially, we take the next Wednesday and we go deeper into each episode. So if this is something that is really sticking with you that you want to learn more about it, please join us. Like we will sit there and we talk for a good hour, sometimes longer <laughs> if, mm -hmm. if it's a really heated subject, which this one kind of is, where we go really deep into it and you can talk with us directly about your concerns or your um, perceptions or your, you know, clarify things that need to be clarified. Mm -hmm. And share your stories, share your conversations you've had, because there is so much going on in this world at all times and there's so many different backgrounds. Oh, yeah. It's... <laughs> Yeah, it can it can Insane. be hard to decide what to do and, and then we kind of feel paralyzed. So we don't want that to happen to you in any form with anything in your spiritual path. So so just bring it to us. We'll we'll talk it through. The Magic Kitchen Podcast is funded and supported by thewitchwoodteahouse.com, offering a variety of hand-blended loose leaf teas, as well as loose herbs for all of your ritual, spell work, wellness, and everyday enjoyment needs. If you would like to support this podcast while sipping a great cup of tea, head over to thewitchwoodteahouse.com and find the magic that's in store for you. There's a difference between using an animal for magic and sacrificing an animal. So we want to start there. So we talked a lot about sacrifices in our in our episode a few episodes ago, season five, episode four, where we talked about offerings. Yes. And if you're a meat-eating mm -hmm. person, sacrifice is a part of your diet. It's something you probably do every day, yes. in a sense. And in some cultures, Islam is one. I lived in the Middle East when I was growing up. I lived in Bahrain, and I traveled across lots of different countries. And at the end of Ramadan, at the first Eid, goats are ritually sacrificed. And it can look pretty horrific. <laughs> like, I remember the first time I saw this, literally, I remember viscerally watching blood run through the streets, because every family kills mm -hmm. a goat. And in Islam, right. they also believe that you can't just eat any meat. You have to eat it that eat meat that was killed halal, which means with a spe yes. special prayer being said over the animal, and then they're killed specifically with a knife in a certain way so that the animal isn't mm -hmm. going to suffer. And also that, that has to do with the way they're cared for too. They can't be in uh, 
you know, like a super tight enclosed area their whole life. They have to have had a decent right. lifestyle. So yeah. that can sound brutal. It can be something from the outside that seems maybe outdated or just not for you. And it, maybe it's still not for mm-hmm. you, but, and it's not for me. I don't think I could kill an animal with my own bare hands, but I'm a hypocrite because I do eat them. So <laughs> sacrificing animals, especially for consumption, especially in a way that is spiritually grounded, like the halal practice mm-hmm. of Islam, it's it's not the same as when we say harming an animal for your magic, you know, for a love spell, for a right. curse, for a hex. That's something very different. It is. And I remember a few years ago, there was a video of a family sacrificing their goats. And I believe it was for this, the purpose you were just talking about. And there's nothing malice about it. There was no, it was a very sacred practice. And that's the difference between sacrificing an animal for consumption and then using that animal in all of its parts to fuel other aspects of your magical practice. But to the outsider who's you know doesn't understand the religion doesn't understand the sacred practice it can look like oh my god you're just killing an animal but not realizing that animal is dinner that animal is a is nourishment uh, the same with swines um in celtic practices swines were believed to be the one animal that could freely roam between the worlds and swine herders were sacred in that aspect too So to consume a swine was to be in honor of that. But it's also nourishment. It's necessary for survival. And, you know, maybe not so much now, but back, you know, ancient time of our ancestors. Yeah, you needed to eat. And if the swine was the only thing you had, then you would sacrifice it, quote unquote, (laughs) in a very sacred way to not only show reverence for the deities that preside over the animal, but also for the magical aspects of that animal. It is a sacred practice. It's not just killing an animal because you want a body part and then you discard the rest. Yeah. Yeah. And there's not going to be an easy yes or no to using animals in the craft. Like I, I wouldn't use an animal that I had to hurt with my own hands. I just don't, I couldn't do it. I just couldn't for that purpose, for the purpose of anything selfish for me which because magic is for ourselves Mm -hmm. most of the time i just can't see why that would be necessary well but and think about the energy that you would end up creating from that because you would feel an an apprehension and an adverse reaction to killing the animal yourself that would leak into your spell and it would backfire somehow there would be a backfire there would be a repercussion that you could not control yep yeah but if I want to do a spell for, you know, f- for, I'm trying to think of one that would even use this because it's just not part of my practice. But no, <laughs> like if you if you wanted a part of an animal, like a like a, a pig's foot or a chicken yeah. leg, or you can mm-hmm. get that from a butcher. You don't have to actually go killing yes. things, you no, know. And I have don't. I use bones in my practice when I find them. Mm-hmm. If I find a nice fresh mm-hmm. bone that's already been nature did its thing. And it is now just a nice white bone. I'm happy to take that home and, you know, take that as a gift from from spirit. But yeah, there's there's ways you can still honor some older practices and beliefs that do yeah. use more spells that 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 use animals. Because I don't think it's a common thing today. I, I've really never come across a modern spell that I don't, would recommend that. <laughs> no. Well, and I think there's a difference between ancient traditional witchcraft and modern traditional witchcraft. And this is where the divide comes from. And I think this is where a lot of confusion comes from of how one person practices compared to another. Modern traditional witchcraft is going to observe modern ideals, modern practices, modern morals and values. Yeah. And yes. that also means we view in our in this day and age in our culture, animal harm is frowned upon. A- you know, animal abuse, child abuse, elder abuse, abuse of any kind is going to be very well defined and it's going to be something we don't engage in. It's not okay. So when we incorporate anything into our practice that is borderline or blatant animal abuse, it's, 
it's not going to resonate with the modern practice of witchcraft. And that is, I think, something that people skirt over in these posts and in these the backtracking that I'm seeing. They're not recognizing that ancient, ancient practices, they viewed animals very, very differently than we do now. Yeah. You know, very utilitarian. Keep, very. Yeah. It, they Animals were an absolute tool. They were a resource. They were not viewed as necessarily as sentient beings unless they were the practitioners who revered the deity or the practice or the the genre of where that animal fell in. But still, they would still use the animal parts because, you know, the uh, hawk heart was sacred to the Egyptians and they followed that pantheon and it was it was OK then. But now it's not. We yeah. recognize that there's other things we can use instead of an actual physical hawk heart. We can use herbs. We can use um, animal allies instead of the actual animal. Yeah. It might sound like a paradox, but traveling to new places is often more grounding than staying home. If you're nervous to be out of your comfort zone and would like to travel, but you're not sure how it fits into your life, or if you're somebody who does travel but wants to get the most out of it, this is the workshop for you. Join me July 22nd at noon EDT for Spirit-Led Travel, Connecting with New Spirits of Place and Land. And get a recording of the workshop when you buy a ticket as well. You can find this event on my Eventbrite, on SeekingNumina.com, and of course in the show notes below. So let's look at history. What kind of spells would use animals in them? And we we talked this through because, like we said, this isn't part of our background in our actual path <laughs> to do these kinds of spells. So we've researched this. And right. mostly it's baneful magic. It's, it's where you use yes. the animal and you... This is awful, but you, you, it's the stand in for the victim of the curse or the hex or the binding right. or the banishing. Yeah. That's sympathetic magic. Yeah. And then the other way, weirdly, is love spells, mm. which mm -hmm. I really like. Uh, Astrea Taylor, she says it really well in Modern Witchcraft with the Greek Gods. She says mm. instead of calling it love magic, call it erotic spells because a lot ah. of those spells, they weren't about love as we would call it. There's no perfect love and perfect trust in, you know, convincing somebody in mesmerizing somebody to fall <laughs> quote unquote in love with you. Love with you. Right. It's yep. an erotic yep. spell. It's not really about <laughs> any sort of empathy mm. there. So I, I like that term erotic spells instead, but yeah. Yeah. Also can be baneful, really, honestly, erot like yes. telling somebody to do something with their emotions like and their body is definitely a baneful practice. So that's that it does make sense yeah. when you think of it that way, that harming animals would be within that. Yeah, it, it's about control manipulation rather than. Yes, that's genuine change that's or growth. Umbrella. Yes, exactly. Yeah. And I think. Yes. It's telling, too, because. Even though you'll see these mentioned, like throughout history, you'll see animal abuse in witchcraft mentioned in ancient mm -hmm. Greece and ancient Rome. The Greek magical yep. papyri, they mention that constantly. You can do a lot of oh, those yeah. spells without it, but – and it's a great text to have if you're into Hellenic pantheons, Roman pantheons, or even because the Celts were so heavily yep. influenced by the Romans – you know, the Gauls were very, very tied together. Like, it's a great book for anybody, I think, to look yes. at. Look at. But yes. it's with that lens of recognizing the, the different way animals were seen. But what they did still know, yeah. in ancient Egypt too, the ancient Greeks, the Romans, the, the Egyptians, they all really coalesced religiously that way. They yeah. all knew that magic took a toll. You didn't do magic alone oh, yeah. back then. The only time you would really do something secretively is if it's a cursed tablet. You wouldn't really like proclaim mm. that to your neighbors because they might tell the yeah. cursed and then the cursed could find that tablet and destroy it. So he kept it quiet. Right. But you would tell your priest or priestess. You would go to the temple yes. to do it because you you needed that support because you knew it was energetically draining. 
So they knew mm. what we still, what today we might call karmic law or the rule of three or the Wiccan read and any harm none. We might call it something different, but they had the same concept. They just, it didn't dissuade them <laughs> like it maybe should have. No. <laughs> yeah. Well, and, and a lot of pra- modern witches are are solitary practitioners. So. <laughs> so you're bearing you know, the brunt I, of that if you do something like this. Yeah. <laughs> And I have and I have witnessed this firsthand, been in situations where, you know, baneful magic has been cast over to me and the person casting it, you know, they're not going to admit they did it, but you can see the signs that they did it because all of a sudden they change their health changes, their yeah. mental status changes and mm-hmm. You know, people, if you're practicing witchcraft, you know how to protect yourself and you're doing that every single day. Yeah. So if you are casting against someone else who is well protected and has very powerful deities looking after them and you're going to go at it alone, you're going to get that backlash hardcore and it's not going to be pretty and you're going to suffer. You're going to suffer a lot. So is it worth it? You know, not only did you do harden the animal, so that's on your conscience, but then the you know energetic backlash is going to come at you too. Yeah, we, yeah, and we that's it. What we sow. <laughs> even from a selfish perspective of like, well, why shouldn't I harm animals? Well, that's one because <laughs> it's not mm-hmm. it's going to harm you back. It's not going to be pretty. No, and you know, if animals are sacred to deities, then we have to believe, we have to understand, we have to. We have to know that the deity is going to look out to protect that animal. Yeah. You know, you're not going to go and, and kill a raven and to claim its wing without expressed permission from the deity that looks after that raven or holds that raven sacred. Yeah. Yeah. And it's important to remember that most deities, Artemis is a really strong example coming to mm. mind for me. Deities of the hunt yeah, yeah. are also deities of protection for wildlife. Yes. So yes. that's that's where we can see that symbol symbolism. Some other ancient practices cuz again this isn't a modern thing really. So there's right. some other ancient texts, some ancient precedents maybe for these modern practitioners who might be choosing to talk about this on TikTok, etc. But mm-hmm. um the ancient Egyptians, they were known to practice yep. animal sacrifice animal even even the PGM, the, the Greek magical papyri, that has a lot of Egyptian influence. Papyri. So if you're interested mm-hmm. in ancient Egyptian practice, that's a good text to go to as well. So they, they did use animals and spells. Um, and the Norse, we know the Norse, not only did yep. they practice sacrifice, like we said, that's different than using an animal for a spell. But for divination, they did. They would sacrifice yeah, they animals to do that. So, But you don't have to. You can scry without adding mm-hmm. blood of insert animal here <laughs> absolutely and or you can find like <laughs> this is crazy to me but you can find an, a plant alternative you know like i mentioned the heart of a hawk you can use wormwood instead you know there's not and, and sometimes even there's um you might see the whole um oh what is it eye of newt right we all know eye of newt that is so iconic what is I have new really? It's mustard seed. It's not literal. <laughs> so sometimes when we're looking at these spells, these old, old spells, they're in code because they had to keep things quiet. They had to keep things secret because if people, you know, if, if the authorities or even even enemies, if they found out what they were using, they could either counter or prosecute or persecute, really. So it, it's amazing that we take things too literally <laughs> as modern witches think not everything was so literal. Yeah. And, and that's indicative that's of good like point. religious yeah. culture in general in this time period, you know, mm-hmm. you'll see people oh, yeah, yeah. who are all Christians warring with each other because some people <laughs> think that the seven days were like a literal thing in Genesis and others who say it was more symbolic, you know, like, right. I don't know what's in the air for that. I don't think we're in the age of Aquarius now. I don't think that's part of it, but it kind of is with the tribal elements of that. So yeah, taking things too literally is probably not a good sign on any spiritual path. Cause no, it's just, you won't get very far. If you're like, I saw a hawk, Mm -mm. a hawk, that was a hawk. 
<laughs> you know, like you have to get into the symbolism <laughs> a little bit, like we talked about in our last episode. Right. Another right. big root of modern witchcraft is alchemy. And alchemy is not magic. They didn't see it quite the same way. Some alchemists did, but as a, as a yeah. whole, it really was like proto-science. And Enochian magic, John Dee was the, the big, uh, I guess you could say, influence for that. And he yeah. and his students, like Edward Kelly, they were alchemists. And as part of that, just like modern science, they did a lot of experiments on animals and a lot of workings that we might today call magic. Like they believed you could create a homunculus that could like be yeah. you. Like it would just be like a little yeah. version of you that could like carry out tasks almost – almost like a golem in like Jewish mythology. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. but those weren't animal sacrificed. Golems weren't. Yeah. So alchemy got a little, a little iffy on that. And so some of the things that came out of that Freemasonry that evolved into different spiritual hermetics, spiritual backgrounds, they may or may not have, cause they still exist. So they're kind of, they keep things quiet. So we don't fully know exactly what they do, but um, they don't explicitly, condemn animal usage in spells so depending on like the yeah. background of a book you might be reading they might have a training in you know theosophical society magic and so they might you know use birds wings and all kinds of stuff like that that you might not expect right away it might catch you off guard but that's because it's coming from this you know like the renaissance it's like the elizabethan era is when this stuff right. is really being written about paracelsus we talked about right. him in our elementals episode this yes, generation of people. Yeah. Well, and think about it also going back to the, the energy of it. Egregores. Egregores are that physical or non-physical entity that is associated often with a physical item. So if we're working with energy, which that's what magic is, right? And we're reading about an, a quote unquote animal that needs to be sacrificed. Maybe it's not so, again, not so literal. Maybe they're talking about an egregore, which shows up in Enochian traditions. It shows up in Greek, ancient Greek traditions. You know, it, it means, egregoros means wakeful, right? And it is that occult concept that it is a non-physical entity that can be infused into a physical item. So maybe part of what they're talking about is... <laughs> <laughs> a root power that, you know, can be used without actual physical thing in front of you. You know, we, we you know, money, money is a great egregore to talk about. We don't have to sacrifice anything for it, but we do all the time with our poor habits or, you know, it, it's, it's the energy of it. If we redirect our focus on that energy, then we can use that egregore. And we can utilize the energy coming from it without killing anything. Are you enjoying the show? If you are, we'd really appreciate a five-star review. It helps us to reach more listeners like you and to keep doing the Magic Kitchen podcast. Thank you. So next, let's talk about substitutions and you know where you find them, how do you find them, that sort of thing, and what things you can do instead of using an actual animal part. Um, like I mentioned, heart of a hawk it can be wormwood. You can use, um, you know, mustard seed is eye of newt. So really, it's about doing your research, finding those <laughs> those substitutions that are probably likely already there. They're plants. They're things that don't have to be necessary blood and bone. Even though witchcraft, I agree, is blood and bone. It's earth and sky. It is all of these very earthy elements. But that doesn't necessarily mean you have to go out and kill something to get the elements. It can be very... Um, plain and non bloody <laughs> mm -hmm. so to speak yeah and it's a good reminder too when we're doing that that research like plants are alive like when we go and we mm -hmm. pick a rose and we're going to use the petals for mm -hmm. something like we're we're ending that bloom so yes 
it's not the same. It's, you know, go ahead, take the rose petals, but think about how that is still something that you are destroying in order to create something new. Because at the end of the day, all of this is a reminder of that, that spiral of life, that connection to life and Mm -hmm. death, that creation and destruction. That's always two sides of the same coin. If you like the idea of reconstructing ancient practices, I think a lot of us do, whether we, we fully want to or not, it's, it's nice to, to look at these old spells, especially in, in books like the Greek magical hierarchy that are so fully Mm -hmm. in existence, you know, it wasn't destroyed. Like we have that. It's it's cool. Like it's it's exciting to think these are things that our ancestors did. So if you can still use those spells, you can just just change it up a little bit. And the best way, the number one thing you can do to replace an animal in any of this is a poppet. And one of the most fun ways to make a poppet and the most spiritual in a way is clay because it is the earth and it, you're yep. using your hands to mold it. And remember like we said in our witchcrafting episode, you don't have to be good. They don't have to look like the person no. <laughs> or the, you know, whatever you're bringing protection to or whatever the spell wants you to do. It doesn't have to actually look like them. Um, right. But that could be a really fun one, clay. Or if you're, if you sew, you can make a little, little felt doll. Little you doll. can make a corn dolly, yeah. yarn dolly, paper doll, anything. You Poppets can, you can carve vegetables too. No, they Ooh, don't. Yeah, and, and they like can that. be vegetables. You know, potatoes, turnips, turnips can can be a substitute for lion's tongue and you can carve that to be a representation. That's what it really boils down to. It's a representation. It is not an exact replica. It is a representation. And if, you know, if you feel the same as we do and feel that animal sacrifice is a big no, no, you know, carving a turnip is going to be a much easier and more energetically aligned act for you. <laughs> yeah. And that's what it always comes down to in our path is our own morality. How are we going to skirt mm-hmm. the gray areas? Because like Leandro started this episode speaking about, we do our work in the liminal. We live in the in-between. Yeah. That's where magic happens. So the gray areas, they're good. We don't want to skirt them and just yeah. stick to the safe stuff. No. We want to figure that they're out important. and we want to decide. Yeah, it's a really important part of our path to – and to be flexible on it, because you might try something, think it's fine, and then feel kind of gross and weird about it. Like, you know, blood magic. Mm-hmm. That's a really big topic. We should probably do an episode on that soon, just in general. Because yeah. it is it is something that's it's tough to talk about, you know, like whether we're talking menstrual blood or small incisions on the hand, like the old fashioned way we think of, you know, it, it, it kind of freaks us out, rubs us the wrong way in the beginning and maybe for the duration. But when we take the time maybe. to think through these things and decide how we feel about morality on a topic and and be flexible on it and openly have conversations on it, it can be an interesting way of, of either reinforcing your beliefs and your practice, or it can be something that, you know, you're, maybe you try something new or you go to a class or a workshop right. on something you wouldn't have expected to be interested in. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. And uh, so a good place to focus there if you you know don't want to harm animals and you want to start using herbs you need to start learning about magical herbalism because this is where we get a lot of our lore we get a lot of um energy from plants but the you can't start using a plant just because you decided to go to your cupboard and pull out a, the spices you really have to connect with that plant you have to understand the energy of that plant and this is how we are able to use plants in our magic is we understand the spirit of that plant we have the permission from that plant to harvest those petals or you know use it in our spell we don't just dump a bunch of cinnamon in our hand and blow it out the door because that's what we do every month sorry <laughs> maybe i'm throwing a little shade there but that is a practice that just it really kind of baffles me because it is a trend right now, but there's no reverence there. There's no regard for that, the energy within that plant there. It's just viewed as a tool. Again, maybe this goes back to our ancient, you know, roots that where, you know, animals and our tools within our craft are just tools to us. But I think we are a little more um, conscious than that. I think we, as a, society as as a culture as modern witches i think we're a little more aware and we should be especially if we're working in the liminal because the the beings the energies that live in the liminal that help us navigate the liminal 
they see what we do. They know what we do. Yeah. And I, I don't think that they look kindly on us when we just disregard the thing <laughs> because we think that it's it's our right or our um, we're entitled to it somehow. Are you ready to start living a magical life? Join me in my Patreon community where I'm sharing rituals for every Sabbath and full moon, weekly journal prompts, and new on the new moon articles highlighting new practices from around the world. Joining a community can be the thing you need to keep your practice active and engaging. For more information, visit patreon.com slash Elise Wells or follow the community link on seekingnumina.com. Working with animals is not inherently bad. So we just wanted to end the episode by discussing some non-baneful ways that you can use animal parts for positive effects. And this might still not align with your morality. You know, like vegans might have a a different perspective on this than we do. Or if, you know, there's a consent issue there too. Even if it's positive magic, like for healing, the animal can't give consent. So maybe you shouldn't do magic to heal them. But personally, I, I do. I one way that I use animal ingredients, the only way I could think of actually was when I find my cat's whiskers, I love to keep them. Yeah. I don't even always know what to do with them, but I like to keep them. And one thing I do with them is I put them in a blessings bag. I have a little satchel sachet that I made for my family. So it has um, a stone that I, I blessed for both me and then I have one for my husband. And then I have some of our hair from both of us. And then I have mm-hmm. my cat's whiskers in there. So it's just this yeah. little blessing that like, you know, it, the stones, I'm going to say it's, I don't even, I don't look at it that often. I, I refresh it, but it's, you know, it's a solid <laughs> sachet. So, but I, yeah. I picked ones for prosperity, but also health. Yeah. Well, and I, I think there's a, there's a good view there of the difference. You found the whisker. It is not something you go and yank out of your cat's head, you know. Good God's no. <laughs> <There's> a... <laughs> That's horrible to think of. Like that makes me cringe. But you never know. Like somebody out there might be doing that. And if <laughs> you're not in my circle, <laughs> yeah. absolutely not, because that's not something that the witches I roam with and commune with do. Because we we value our animals. We value. The living creatures, even the plants around us, they all have this sacredness that I would never violate them in that way. And that's and that's exactly how I view it, that if you're going to actively cause harm, anxiety, um, you know, stress in an animal for your benefit, you're you're harming them. And that's not OK. And that's what it really boils down to is are you causing havoc are you are you (laughs) being intrusive are you being respectful that's the difference between modern witchcraft and ancient witchcraft when when we get down to it is the difference in in how we interact and you know you don't have to be baneful to get your magic to work and i think it's actually better when we're not baneful when we are able to be in alignment with the energy that we need for the working. If we're looking for positive change, then we need to be positive in creating that change. Um, there, I mean, there's, and there's of course gray areas that we're going to fall into. Just like Elise said, you know, that that liminal space itself is gray. But if we are not aligned with the energies that we're trying to work with, for one, and the energies that we inherently hold true with our values within ourselves, then we are not going to have effective magic. And, you know, finding cat whiskers, finding feathers, finding even fur and that sort of thing, you know, on a hike or I have a, I have a great story, actually. This will absolutely demonstrate when an animal part comes to you and when you should use it. So I'm in my garden. I'm, you know, finishing up some gardening. And I'm just standing there. This was several years ago. And I was, just, I don't know, I was just staring at something like maybe surveying my <laughs> work, I guess. And literally out of nowhere, a red tail hawk feather 
came floating out of the sky and planted itself quill side down in front of me. That was a clear message that that was a gift for me. And I still have that feather. It's still here. It was in my yard, fell right in front of me. And that is an example of when we are gifted the tools that we need to use. You know, I didn't go hunt down the hawk and pull the feather out. Um, Same with my cat whiskers. I have a jar of cat whiskers. And I don't go around and, you know, restrain my cat to pull out the whisker type thing. Um, there, on social media, there is, you know, this debate of drowning mice for spells. To me, that would be absolutely not okay. Absolutely not. I would never do that because that does not align with my beliefs. It does not align with my core values. And it is harmful to that animal. So to me, that just completely nullifies the spell. You have just destroyed all any and all energy that you're trying to create with that spell because you have just created an anxiety a harm that will reflect on you. And that's where we really have to look at our practice and how we conduct ourselves. Mary meet, Mary part, and, and Mary meet, meet again. again. Thank you for joining us on the Magic Kitchen podcast. Please visit my website, leandrawitchwood.com for news, information, and more episodes. I'm Elise Wells, and I can be found at Seeking Numina on YouTube, Instagram, and Facebook, and SeekingNumina.com. That's Seeking N-U-M-I-N-A.